Hello there, friends. My name is James Wordsmith. I'm, I'm a reader, a writer, and I'm a publisher, and many more things as well. But I'm here today to tell you about a story. In fact, five stories. <laughs> I am going to take you into the world of publishing in the 21st century. The way the books have changed since then, the way we experience books today, and what books have in store for the future. Our first story is a mystery, a crime mystery. So listen closely and enjoy the ride. It was late December. Thick snow fell from the gloomy, foreboding sky. World-famous author Eleanor McIntosh was celebrating her latest book release. She invited all the bigwigs to her annual Christmas celebration at her country manor house. What happened next? Nobody could have predicted. <laughs> Congratulations on your new book, Eleanor! Oh. To Eleanor! Well, oh. Oh. Fantastic. <laughs> what was oh. that? My, my book is dead. It came as no surprise when the call came in. It was the third book this week. Whoever or whatever was doing this was smart and moving fast. It was up to me, Detective Frankie Pasquale, to solve the case, find the killer. It was much worse than I first anticipated. Any one of these guests could be the killer. The foul stench of murder laid pungent in the tense atmosphere. Was it society? Ebooks? Amazon? Or was it those strange Facebook and Twitter twins? I would have to interrogate them individually. So, Mr. Amazon, why'd you do it? I know people have been talking, saying that Mr. Amazon is going to put the big six publishers out of business, destroy 95% of all agents, and revolutionize the publishing industry by becoming the dominant force. But well, that's what any business strives for, and it shouldn't be something to feel bad about. All authors blaming me for their eventual downfall is like blaming a lion for being king of the jungle. And all I have done is evolve from the times. That's exactly what other book distributors should have done. We save money by selling e-books in the UK from Luxembourg. We buy a huge bulk for additional savings and use our colossal market shares to secure c concessions from suppliers. We did have a share of over 90% of the ebook market and that may have been taking its toll on the publishing industry. It's all just business and may the best businessman win. If you're looking for someone to blame, I say you look closer into society. Society, you look like a murderer. It ain't my fault the book is dead. Yeah, I pressure authors into changing their ideas, but just to make the readers happier. If it weren't for me, the book wouldn't have been sold. Maybe the authors aren't what they used to be and need help from the audience to finish and change their ideas. Now, we can become more involved in everything. Surely that's a good thing. The whole world can connect with anybody through computers, phones, laptops, anything with an internet connection. Everyone swoons over authors being so brilliant when, in this day and age, any of us could write a book. Authors are helped by society. I did not kill it. I'm pointing the finger at ebooks. Ah, Mr. Ebook. Was it you? Me? I'm just a side effect of the changes in technology. And I'm just what society wants. Otherwise, three million people a month wouldn't be buying me. I'm just much more convenient, me. I didn't kill anyone. If anything, the people killed the book. Everything was so much easier before bloody Twitter and Facebook rubbish. They want everything in the same place on their phones and computers. So, the Facebook and Twitter twins. Is that a guilty conscience I can smell? The author should think social media. If anything, all I've done is help books. Yeah, not accusing of murder. Twitter has over 500 million active users. What you forget is all these people on these sites promote and advertise. Facebook dominates the social media market with over 1 billion active users. It is my users who make things trend on Twitter or get companies and their products liked on Facebook. Talking about the latest films, books, television programs. We talk about it and the company is profit from it. It is free slave labor. We have aided the book on its growth. We haven't digitalized everything like Amazon did with the Kindle. Yeah, blame Amazon, brother. Yeah, you destroyed the book market. As time went by, it soon dawned on me. It was not just one killer. All of them played their part beautifully. 
Society was the spine of the operation, binding the entire sinister plot. That leads me onto the Twitter and Facebook twins. With society behind them, they could move forward in their plan to dominate. Then comes Amazon, the father of the ebook, fueling his mad son's rise to power. Now a new chapter has begun. As they say, never judge an ebook by its cover. All I had to do was read between the lines. The books lost the battle today, but the war rages on. I'm getting close now. Maybe. Too close. The future is unclear. But I do know one thing. Ink runs thicker than blood. Oh, you're back. Uh, I've got some good news. It's still alive, it's not dead. Uh, it's still breathing, but it's actually touch and go whether it'll survive much longer. How wonderful is the freedom that publishers and authors and readers actually have? What exactly is this freedom? The next story is going to tell us all about the autonomy of the publishing field. The autonomy of the publishing field is being jeopardised by the digitalisation of the publishing field. In other words, the distinctions between the publishing field, the author, and the reader are becoming more hazy. As Francesca Pasquale states in her article, the participatory turn in the publishing industry, rhetorics and practices. It is becoming increasingly difficult to hypostatize the reader, separating him or her from her simultaneous status as a technology user, a consumer, and part of media audiences. Online collaboration distorts the distinction between authors and readers as readers share their stories online discuss text and even go as far as to create alternate endings for their favourite books. Through grassroots storytelling, the average citizen is given the opportunity to publish their story online and contribute to other people's stories. The interaction between media audiences creates social media most commonly Twitter and Facebook. more and more people turn to online collaboration, the number of small-scale indie publishers has been progressively increasing. The indie publishers threaten the autonomy of the publishing field as they exert an external control over what gets published. This unprecedented participation of the reader is in the publishing industry is described by John Thompson's book, Merchants of Culture. It went from the publishers being king and the author being grateful for the opportunity to have some work presented to the public to the author being king and the publishers being used by me and my author as a tool to let the book into the marketplace. E-readers can provide another way for readers to interact with each other as users can highlight, annotate, and bookmark parts of the ebook. Or select a section that appeals to them and send it to their friends. This social reading can occur in many forms. Friends talking about a book through social media. Someone writing a review on Amazon. Or commenting on a YouTube video. There are benefits to these forms of online collaboration, as it's true that analysing audience data can help publishers create better targeted content. However, with all these different media platforms for readers to collaborate on, it is detracting from the established writers, as it is easy for anybody to publish their work online and consider themselves as an author. Pasquale expresses that it is not only reading and writing that have integrated into one entity, online collaboration but also that the physical act of reading is now more integrated with e-readers. Readers are also classified as part of a media audience who are not merely using technology, but they are consuming it.
The deterioration of the culture from the book is also jeopardising the autonomy of the publishing field as it is once considered as a tangible representation of the field. Since reading has evolved from ink and paper to electronic devices, people have begun using slogans such as end of the book and the death of publishing. However, Pasquale dubs these slogans as tempting slogans to use describing the current state of art. The book is not becoming obsolete. Instead of traits and the functions, the older medium will be combined with the, n the newer one. Not despairing, but reborn in the new, better forms. For example, book text on screen. According to Dr. Henry Jenkins and David Thornburn, in rethinking media change the ethics of transitions. Overall, there is no certainty as to where the participation of readers ends and authorship begins, as the increase in online collaboration obscures the distinction between readers and authors, and increases the tensions between readers, authors and the publishing field. Just a moment, I'm just trying to finish a chapter in my new book. And um, yeah, all right, I'm back. Uh, now that you know a little bit more about the publishing field and uh, all the freedom that's involved, I can tell you about my friend Kevin. Now, Kevin left his garage to become an author. I have to tell you, his wife wasn't so happy. But you'll see it all for yourself with your own eyes. This next story is all about authors and readers and publishers and their relations. in the garage. I packed it in, signed it over to Tyrone. What? Why on earth would you do that? That life's over for me. I've done my final oil change. What's going on, Kevin? What are you talking about? My dream, Sal. My lifelong dream of being an author. Oh, Kevin, you're a mechanic. You're not any good at writing. Well, I've read this article by a media analysis called Francesca Pasquale, and she says right here... Digitalisation is affecting the press infrastructure, the social practices of reading and the status of the book, and the very same author and reader's roles and relations. And what's that supposed to mean? It means the roles are changing, Sally. It means that because of media convergence, the traditional concept of an author and the publishing field is blurring. Oh, come off it, Kevin. It's right, Sally. You've read Fifty Shades of Grey, haven't you? Well, that started off as fan fiction of Twilight, and now look at how successful that's been. So what are you saying? I'm saying what Dan Gilmore said in We The Media. That the lines will blur between producers and consumers, changing the role of both in ways we're only beginning to grasp now. Don't you see, Sally? I'm participating. Don't be silly, Kevin. This doesn't mean that we can accept the participatory term as a given fact, nor can we accept the commonsensical circulation of the word participation, as it says here in your stupid article. What are you on about now, Sally? You can't just battle the word participation around willy-nilly. There's a lot of steps in the ladder of participation, Kevin. But... Just because the field of publishing has changed, doesn't mean you can automatically become an author. As Pasquale says, most authors that animate the debate on digital publishing are talking about access, not about strong participation. Now, Sally, you're the one chatting nonsense. How? Access is just basically generating the opportunity for people to have their voices heard. That doesn't make them an author, Kevin. Not as reckons he's an author just because he tweets short stories all day in the cabin with Rita. So what you're saying, Sal? Norris tweeting his story about Ken Barlow buying a magazine from the top shelf isn't on the same scale as Roald Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It doesn't make him any less of an author. It's all storytelling. Why don't you just start a blog then, Kevin? 
Why would that help? Grassroots storytelling and social media increasingly work as collaborative writing environments, bringing out participatory forms of online writing. What are you on about now, Sally? It means we can meet in the middle, Kevin. That way you can be an author and work at the garage. Forget this. What do you say we just go down to the Rovers and have a pint? <laughs> Hello. Hope you're having a good time so far and hope you're keeping up. I've just been reading a book here on my uh, tablet and I'm not quite sure if I've decided if I prefer the tablet to read or the old ink and paper. But the next story, the next video, is all about the War of the Worlds. The printed versus the digital. I'm Abby Cookson, and I've come here today to take The Apprentice by storm. My name's Brendan Clayton, and I'm here on The Apprentice to show them how a true warrior fights. Take your seat now. So have a look at your CVs. And on paper you look good. But so does fish and chips. The last time we spoke, I asked you to read Francesca Pasquale's essay. You took your route with the technology, and you will fight your side on the side of the ebook and its popularity in the modern day society. And you, you were good old fashioned ink and paper. You were made after my own heart. So, who should we start with? Ebooks. I'm not really up to speed with this wishy-washy nonsense. And what's wrong with a good old fashioned book? They're expensive to make and distribute, Lord Sugar. <sighs> from what I've learned from Pasquale is that we must now acknowledge that some fundamental changes are taking place. All I bloody know is, Pasquale doesn't take sides. So, big boy books over there. What have you got for me? Huh, oh, got a lot for you, Lord Sugar. Frederick Kilgore says that e-books are not as comfortable as a book. He calls it the can't cuddle up syndrome. However, I don't particularly believe, like Kilgore, that e-books have solved any major issue. Right, I see. But Lord Sugar, people are just struggling to adjust to this new technology. Yeah, I see your point. Why would people drop something that has been used for centuries? The fact is, people find ink on paper comforting. Ultra, you know him well. He believes the value of an e-book is the same as a bloody book. And at the end of the blooming day, a book is written by an author and is read by its readers. It doesn't matter where or what it's read on. The writing itself never changes. I agree in ways, Lord Sugar, but people become obsessed with new technology and having a new way to do the same thing. This is something fresh and in demand. I disagree completely. Most people believe that the value and qualities they get from picking up a book and flicking through its pages is one that cannot be matched. Look, Ewan Morris, a published writer, says that in the next 25 years, most readers will have turned to e-books. We are experiencing the digital revolution. Who is this kid? I keep hearing a lot of hot air coming out of your mouth. So in the interest of the climate change, shut up for a second. Pasquale herself even discusses how the digital revolution is already on the rise and affecting the status of the author. They now have to use social networking sites such as Facebook and Twitter to reach out to their readers. I think you 
are forgetting about the Royal Bookworms. Negrofonte doesn't believe ebooks will favour them. They will always stick with books. As long as books are being read, they will be a part of our society. The way ebooks are developed, they include internet access and games. This takes away from the nature of the book. There are too many distractions. I think you're forgetting that he states that because of the cost and labour of publishing books, that they'll have to stop. The fact is, they're not environmentally friendly. American author Steve Ketman says they'll never stop being bought. People buy them for birthdays and Christmas. So unless all the books in the world vanish, I don't see where your argument can go from here. I like that you both believe in your size of the argument, but not long ago did you believe in the tooth fairy. And frankly, I don't believe there'll ever be the death of books. And technology and the way we learn as humans is evolving. So I think you both made valid points. But frankly, this is where your journey ends. The fact is, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be fair to pick one. So I'm gonna have to fire you both. You're both fired. Thank, Thank you, you for this opportunity. Fuck you, man. Yeah, that old grey-haired man is right. It's impossible to choose. I could read the book here on paper, and then maybe I could get some extra content on my tablet. Perhaps I should go online and get some merchandise, or I could even contact the author and tell him what I thought. The, the possibilities are endless. Our last story has a bit of magic in it. But more specifically, it uses the magical phenomenon, which is Harry Potter, to question the benefits that we've been going through for the last 20 minutes. Is digitalization really a gift? We're not to judge, we're here to question. I'll see you on the other side. In the last 50 years, the way we experience books has gone through major changes. Digitalisation of books goes back to the 60s, but the changes became more fundamental in the 21st century. The best way to show those changes is looking inside the world of the most popular book of our generation, the Harry Potter series. The basic change is of course the opportunity to read books on a screen instead of turning pages. But let's not focus on that, let's focus on the whole experience. So. What can a reader, or in today's case the user, do after he read the books, whether on paper or an electronic device? George is a keen Harry Potter fan going online to broaden his experience of this magical world. The first website he comes across is harrypotter.co.uk, supposedly the main Harry Potter website online, operated by Warner Brothers since they bought the rights for the Harry Potter films in 1999. The website is a great interactive experience, offering multiple videos, special features and downloads along with promotional offers to purchase Blu-ray editions of the films or book the Harry Potter Warner Brothers tour. Now, let's take a look at another website, pottermore.com, operated by Sony is an incredible example of how books are no longer just text, but can be experienced through images and interactive games. It's a place to explore the series and the magical world more than ever before, and to discover exclusive new content from J.K. Rowling herself. The Pottermore Shop allows readers to purchase digital audio books and ebooks as well. Moving forward, another major change is our interaction with authors. Authors are now in the very centre, the heart of the publishing scene and the readers have opportunities to connect with them. In our case, George can go to jkrowling.com and read the recent news about the creator of his favourite series, check out her new book or just enjoy their interactive website. He can also visit her Twitter or Facebook accounts and maybe even get a response if he decides to leave a message. But what if George wants to participate in the writing experience rather than just exploring what is already exposed? 
What if he wants to share his theories and ideas? Thanks to digitalisation and the World Wide Web, he can do it on various fan fiction websites and one of the most popular websites is The Leaky Cauldron. The Leaky Cauldron is a Harry Potter fan community which offers, along with news, pictures and info about the books and the films, a creative environment for fan writers. It even has submission guidelines and evaluation criteria. Another good example of a fan writing environment is harrypotterfanfiction.com, a very short and catchy name if you ask me, but it does the work with over 75,000 stories and the eye-catching motto, the story continues. You can also always visit fan blogs. Talking about social networking, let us not forget YouTube. YouTube is full of inspiring and sometimes absurd videos ranging from the Potter Puppet Pals sensation to a collection of all the spells that were used in the films. Now, wait a second, this is all really great, but what lies under the attractive layers of interactivity and participation? Almost every website has an online shop, many offer payable extra content, and the merchandise industry has never thrived better. From wands, robes, brooms and chocolate frogs, to films, computer games and PlayStation accessories. Remember who operates Baltimore? Because of digitalization, systems have the opportunity to control interactive content and have even more control over us. Outside the bubble of choice and participation, may lay a cynical machine exploiting our interests and trying to hypnotize us just to earn more money. In fact, Warner Brothers, you know, the indie anonymous company we mentioned before, was so keen to be the exclusive distributor of Harry Potter content when they bought the rights from Rowling that they just started to hunt down fun websites. Some of them were operated by children. Warner Brothers did it in the name of copyright infringement but many suspect that it was to gain as much control as possible over the popular series. Participation can be a powerful agent of shared knowledge if we make the right choices and use interactivity wisely. But, and there is a huge but, we must be aware that the power available to the players in the industry nowadays, thanks to that digitalization, is even greater. It is now a hidden power, and it may knock on our doors in a disguise of interactivity. This might just become a costume, a mask hiding the cold cynical face of global digital capitalism. Well, that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed yourself, because I know I have. I hope you've had a lot of interesting experience and you've learned a lot, because every good story has a good message behind it. Hope you've got a lot of food for thought. And speaking of food for thought, I'm quite hungry myself and I think I'm going to go out and buy some stuff in my fridge because there's nothing left. One day, they might even find a way to download things for your fridge. You never know. Off the internet. But anyway, that's for the future. Goodbye.